everyone welcome back to all of you that joined us yesterday and um, welcome to all of you that maybe couldn't join yesterday that have joined us today so just a little bit of housekeeping this morning so i'm poppy townsend and i'm communications manager at cedar um, i'm not going to go through everyone on the speakers list because hopefully most of you joined yesterday um, but i'm sure the speakers will introduce themselves before the beginning of their talks so a bit of boring stuff with housekeeping um, if you've got any questions to ask the team, then please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window. Um, I'll then collate them all up and we'll have a question and answer panel session at the end of today where we're going to answer as many of them as possible. Um, if you're having any technical issues or you've got a general question or comment, then feel free to use the chat window. Um, and you can either send that to just us as the panelists or to everyone on the attendee um, list. And just another reminder that these webinars will be recorded and shared um, in the next couple of weeks. Okay, so I can see that we've got 68 people joined us today, but obviously we can't see what you look like and we don't know who you are. So we've got a couple of um, polls to ask you to see what you're all up to on Jasmine. So let me just find the right one. Hopefully now you should be able to see a poll in the middle of your window. Can someone's voted? Fantastic. So we'll just give you 30 seconds to fill it in. Oh, we've got a variety. Lots of you have less than six months, which is great. Welcome all you newbies. Just give you another five seconds. Three two, one, end it and then share the results with you all. So hopefully you should see the results. Um, most popular answers between one and three years, but we do have quite a range of different lengths of time using Jasmine, which is great to know. So thank you everyone for filling that in. So and then the next question we've got is about the different types of Jasmine services that you use. So let me just launch this one and this one is um, multiple choice so you can tick as many boxes as that apply to you basically so take away Ooh, lots of movement on this one <laughs> okay I'll give you another 10 seconds let's see if a few of you are still going Okay, another five seconds. Three, two, one, end it and share the results with you. So, as probably expected, lots of you are using the Sign Machines, but quite a broad range across all our other services, which is great to know. So, a lot of our talks today are going to cover lots of these different topics. So, hopefully, they should all be interesting and relevant to you all. Okay. Right, enough about getting to know you guys. What you're actually here for is our timetable for today. So we've got a range of different talks um, all about new developments. I'm sure you've all seen the timetable and you know what talks you want to see. But just as a reminder, here's the rough timings that we're going to try and stick to today. So that's the um, first half and then the second half includes a 10 minute break so you can go make a coffee. Um, another couple of new development talks and then we're going to end the event with a Q&A panel with um, all of the speakers and a couple of other um, Jasmine people team interested parties um, but we'll introduce everyone and from the questions we've got so far they kind of cover those topics listed at the bottom so you can kind of get the sense of what we're going to discuss and then we'll be finished hopefully by half past twelve. Okay, that's enough from me. Um, so up next we've got Ag talking about the software stack. Thank you very much, Poppy. You're welcome. Okay, hello everyone. Um, my name is Ag Stevens. I am the head of partnerships at CEDA. And I've, I'm here to give you an update on software available on Jasmine. Um, so 
in the last year, year and a half, we've, we've made some significant changes and some of them have coincided with a general migration to a new upgraded operating system. So we're now running on CentOS 7. Um, and so I'm going to talk mainly about the common software that is available on the Jasmine interactive SI servers and our batch um, cluster, which is known as Lotus. Um, in specifically, I'll talk about our Jaspi environments and another environment called Jasmine Sci. Um, I'll talk a little bit then about how you can build your own environments um, and then mention various other things um, related to different types of software that might be of interest. To put this talk into context, um, those of you that weren't with us yesterday may not have seen this diagram before, but um, what we've tried to do um, throughout the online conference is just come back to this diagram that tries to give an overview of our services um, and our sort of hardware situation as well on Jasmine. And so this is all about software and that sits inside our compute services. And these are our, our generally available compute services. So if you're a Jasmine login user, you should have access to these. And so we're talking about software typically that's available on the batch system and the interactive system. But I will also mention some things like the um, transfer software, which is relevant to our transfer services. So first thing we have um, quite extensive help pages now to um, explain how everything works on Jasmine, but we have a, a software on Jasmine top level page, um, which talks through the various ways in which you might want to um, access software and the kinds of software you might want to access. Um, and most people are interested in the um, packages that are made available to do data analysis and that kind of thing. So these are software that, that are installed on the analysis servers or the, the SI servers as they're known and also are available across all the Lotus nodes. We also have tools available for compiling and building software. Um, there is some software that is restricted access so you have to register for it and it, it may only be available to certain communities. Um, there are some software that's only available on specific servers. And of course, most of you will be interested in getting data onto Jasmine or, or pulling data from Jasmine, and you're dealing with, with large amounts of data. So data movement or data transfer software is also an important part of what we need to provide. So if we jump in and think first about the data analysis software, um, we have a whole heap of Python and other packages that we are now grouping together into separate environments. Um, and we've chosen to use a packaging tool, tool called Conda, um, which many of you will have used or will be aware of as the main package management tool. So Conda is really, really useful um, because it allows us to package a group of um, specific versions of software packages together into something that we call an environment. And that environment has its own identifier. Um, and we can also link that to information about that environment. So we've, we've called our Jasmine Python environment Jaspi. Um, and we have a Python 2.7 and a Python 3.7 environment, but we also have different versions of those as well. On the right hand side here, you can see the sort of packages that are, in, that are included as standard if you log into our um, interactive servers or on Lotus. Um, and these are packaged within Jasper. Secondly, we have this thing called the Jasmine Sci environment. And that is essentially things that we couldn't install through the Conda route, but we knew that were um, re requested by a lot of users and therefore we wanted to make them available on Jasmine. And so we are installing those packages through um, RPMs. Um, and our, that, that method was what we used to use um, in something called the Jasmine Analysis Platform, um, which was the, the precursor to Jasper. 
So just an overview of what we're trying to provide in JASPI um, based on what the requirements were and, and the, the solution that we are providing. So in terms of reproducibility, um, we think it's really important that any scientific workflows need to be able to reproduce their results. So we, we want to be able to provide a specific set of packages and versions um, from a set of initial requirements. And then we want to be able to maintain access to that set of packages over time. So if you're, if you're doing a set of runs that maybe take three months and halfway through we update our default environments, we'll, we want to be able to provide the ability for you to actually select the previous environment and keep running with that rather than suddenly finding that all the software's changed and the impacts that that might have on your workflow. In terms of documentation, we want to be able to guide users on what software is available and how to access it. And so taking this JASPI solution enables us to, to link to more detailed um, documents and repositories where we say, these are all the packages that made up a given environment and these are all the versions of each of those packages. Um, I suppose as mentioned in, in the first issue, multiple environments are important because users need to be able to potentially access different packages at different versions for different projects. And so JASPI gives us the ability to potentially have um, numerous Python 3.7 environments, all with packages at different versions, all living on the system at the same time. And a really important thing for us is to be able to manage this on what is quite a limited staff resource. Um, so that following the, the Conda model gives us the ability to easily construct, test, deploy and document our, our environments um, and reproduce them for different systems. So the kind of um, environments we have, um, there are a few things going on here. So we've, we've written our own um, software package called JASPI Manager, which is just a set of tools that wrap Conda um, and allow us to define an initial set of requirements and then run that through Conda to create, build an environment and then be able to redeploy it onto Jasmine and potentially redeploy it elsewhere as well. Um, so we build these environments and then we list all the package in GitHub repositories, packages in GitHub repositories. And you can just see an example here of a list of a set of packages and all their versions. These lists get very long because they include the dependencies of other dependencies. So some of our JASPI environments will have three, 400 um, software packages listed within them. Of course, from the user perspective, you just want to be able to say um, which, uh, which software environments are available, available, how do I activate them and how do I deactivate them? So this slide is just about using the module command, which many of you will be familiar with on Jasmine, and it gives you the opportunity to search for which environments are available, and then you can load or activate each environment and deactivate it as well. And um, one of the key things here is that you can, there is a default version of JASPI at any point in time, and you can look that up on our help pages. Um, um, but also you can specify a specific version of an environment. So JASPI will point to a, a default version, which is 3.7. Um, you can module load JASPI 3.7, but there's actually revisions which are date stamped um, beneath that. So it's really important when you're running a workflow that you know actually which date stamp version you're working with. So if it, if it gets superseded, you can still go back and select that one to complete your workflow. The Jasmine Sci environment, as I said, was about um, being able to provide other packages that weren't available through the Conda route. Um, and so this is a supplement to Jaspi, and th this provides a number of packages. Um, some of the examples included here are Ferret, Leafpad, NC Comp, and XComp. And it's important to know that you can enable both the Jasmine Sci and the Jaspi environments together and we have advice on the help pages about the order you should do that in to make sure that all the packages are, are found properly by your, um, by your session. So of course you, you might need to build your own environments as well. 
And so the simplest approach... Sorry, Ag, you've got two minutes, all right. Thank you. Simplest approach is to build on top of the Jaspi environments. I mean, you can do that with Python's virtual env or vemv and install using pip. You can actually bypass Jaspi completely and you can build your own Conda environments if you need to. And it's really important to, to think about where you're installing your environments because your, your home directory is um, appropriate because it's good for small files. Um, if you need to share your environments with other users, then think about using a small files group workspace as we discussed yesterday. Um, we also have help pages that tell you about compilers and parallel libraries. Um, so adv advice is available on using the, the dev tool set um, and using GNU Fortran compilers. Um, and these allow you to compile typically to, to run things like MPI parallel jobs on the Lotus cluster. There's also software that's um, contributed by the community. Some examples here listed that are provided by the Met Office, um, our FCM, Rose and Silk, and Afterburner. Um, so these are contributed in a place where everyone can access them. And we've also been talking to the ESM Valtor community, and there is a, a community installation plan there. So if you have your own tools that you think could be useful in this way, get in contact with us and we can discuss whether this would be an appropriate route. Many of you are involved in data transfer. Um, so we have a nice um, help scout, sorry, help desk article, which, which tells you about this in our help pages. Um, typically, if you're doing quick, small transfers, you might look at traditional Linux tools like SCP and RSync. But we also have access to more sophisticated tools such as Grid FTP, Globus Online. And if you're pulling data from the Met Office um, trans, the batch, sorry, the Met Office archive, you can pull it over the Moose client and there's information on how to do that. It's really important that you use dedicated transfer servers rather than using the scientific analysis servers for transfer work. A few things we didn't mention here. Um, so there are other languages just available on our standard systems. We have IDL installed with interactive and runtime licenses. So there are thousands of runtime licenses if you need to run on Lotus with IDL. And later on, we'll mention Jupyter Notebooks. Um, we've not had time here to mention workflow tools such as Rose and Silk. Um, we have a number of links throughout this um, this slide set, so please refer to those and here are some of the main help pages that I mentioned. So thank you very much. Um, as ever, find more information in the usual places or following the links I've talked through and I'll now hand you over to Fatima, who is going to talk about transitioning um, to Slurm. We've had a slight change of plan, Ag, which you probably aren't aware of whilst you're talking, but Fatima needs to talk a little bit later today. So we've just had to make a last minute change. Um, so we've now actually got Matt talking about the tendency sign machines now. I've posted the new timetable, like timings in the chat window, and hopefully you should have got an email as well, everyone. So Thank Matt, you. Over to you. Thanks, Ag. Thanks, Poppy. Thanks, Ag. Uh, just give me a second to share my screen. Okay. Oops. So, um, tenancy sign machines um, is something we mentioned yesterday, and um, it's a concept that we're keen to uh, try and introduce. Well, we've piloted it a little bit already. Um, but we want to try and roll this out a bit more widely. Um, so we thought we'd um, tell you about uh, what they are exactly, what it involves, what the benefits are, and what we plan to do. Um, so if you like, um, the uh, scientific analysis servers, or sign machines as we call them, currently they're shared by everyone. Um, there are some issues with that. And uh, we think that um, the uh, a solution to this is an alternative approach with sign machines um, shared by um, particular communities and then we can have multiple ones of those provided with the um, Jasmine Community Cloud. Um, so we'll talk about what we've done so far and um, the plan from here. So uh, just a reminder of, of where we are in the kind of context diagram 
and we're talking about the slime machines here in the interactive compute um, and what we're proposing is that we use the Jasmine Community Cloud to enable instances of those um, slime machines to be deployed within cloud tenancies over here. So what are the issues that we currently face with um, the uh, slime machines? There's some pros and cons. So the current ones, uh, they're, they're pretty easy to find, easy to access, um, and they provide interactive compute for um, various small tasks. There's the common stack of, stack of software installed um, between these sign machines and the Lotus batch cluster. And you can also use uh, the sign machines to submit, monitor, manage the, the jobs that you're running on the, um, the cluster. So they're pretty useful things. And um, I think as we saw in the poll earlier, probably the most popular bit of Jasmine that people um, tend to use. Some of the cons though, and there's quite a wide range of usage patterns. Um, you could call it a bit of a free for all. Um, so we do find sometimes that, um, you know, with resources being consumed um, heavily by a small number of users, that, that can um, affect the performance of these machines for, for everybody. Um, sometimes they lock up. Um, and there are arguably processes which, you know, are run on these machines which really should be farmed out to um, the batch cluster. So, you know, particularly large, uh, you know, large uh, code runs, uh, routine repeated processing, sometimes production workflows, which which really, um, you know, need to, to make use of the, the, um, the batch um, um, environment. On our part, from the support side, they require um, some constant monitoring. We try our best. Um, and, you know, we've got more of them now than we used to, but that, of course, means more monitoring. And, you know, given that all the machines are shared between everybody, um, any interventions to try and sort problems out um, affects quite a lot of people. Um, so what can we do about that? So um, we think that the, the solution involves um, uh, sign machines shared by a community instead. Um, so how does that work exactly? So the Jasmine team uh, would maintain a virtual machine template, uh, which is, if you like, approved to be deployed into any um, a managed tenancy. So that's a managed tenancy is one that needs to be able to access the secure resources like good workspaces, um, the Cedar archive file systems, and to be able to submit jobs to Lotus. So it needs to be able to do all of those things. So it needs to be a template that's created in a particular way um, and kind of approved by by the system team. Um, and, and that team would keep that template up to date. So for example, it's been recently been updated to uh, CentOS 7 on your operating system, and it's able now to, the, the machines deployed from that template can submit to Slurm rather than um, LSF, the previous sort of batch manager. So the Jasmine team would also set up the tenancy on the cloud platform and, and make an overall assignment of um, memory disk CPU um, and set it up as a, as a service in the accounts portal. Um, they can then assign um, one or more managers, even some deputies, who will be able to approve applications um, for access from people from that community. So the idea is that the, the manager or the deputies would be people from that community who know who's who, what their needs are, but also um, in that role willing to take on um, that, that role of sort of managing that service for that community. The idea is partly that um, the users from that community are likely to have broadly similar workflows, perhaps um, therefore disrupt each other a bit less. And so it's easier for members of that community to agree, you know, usage patterns and behavior, and, and hence the use of the machine resources among themselves. Um, and the manager can, can kind of gain a, a collective view of, um, the uh, um, you know the, the requirements uh, for that, that um, community. So within the agreed envelope of resources, the CPU, the memory, and the disk, um, you can then the manager can then deploy um, as many um, machines as will fit. But they can talk to the Jasmine team um, if they need to to have uh, you know additional um, resources assigned to that tenancy and to be able to to deploy uh, new ones. If, uh, additional ones if needed. 
one of the advantages is that the, um, the, the manager can talk to their own community. So if there's any interventions needed, like restarting the machine, um, they can talk to their own users. And um, the idea is that that intervention only affects that, that community of users, which is um, obviously a benefit. And it can be done at a time to suit, suit those particular users. Um, yeah, so uh, given the overall resources, additional machines can be deployed. Um, and these machines can be accessed in exactly the same way. So they are inside the, the fence, if you like, but they're accessible via the, the standard uh, login or NX login, as we saw yesterday, the, the, the different types of login nodes in exactly the same way as um, the, the current shared ones. And another benefit of this is that we can support many um, tenancies uh, in this way. So we can have multiple um, of these managed tenancies, each with, with one or more sign machines. Um, we're limited pretty much just by the resources that the cloud um, platform has as a whole. About two minutes, Matt. Okay, so these are available alongside the existing shared um, uh, machines, which, which won't disappear just for now. Um, they're gonna stay there, we'll talk about why. So what we've we done so far, we've done a pilot rollout to a limited set of communities so far. That was with our um, existing cloud platform. And now we've got an additional cloud platform um, available. That's got greater capacity and it's also got some better features which um, suit the provision of this type of um, service a bit better. And as I say, the template has recently been updated um, to cater for, for the current um, uh, operating system and, and batch cluster. So the plan from here then really is to um, do this as a wider rollout and to uh, engage with um, uh, more communities to get them set up with a tenancy like this. We will retain the, the shared sign machines, particularly for um, so that we can have the physical machines, which give the high memory. Um, and for users, sometimes they're not particularly attached to a big community with someone available to do this kind of manager role. So there will still be the shared ones available, but where possible, the default would be that we would use this model for for, for most communities. The idea being that you get some autonomy in, re in return, if you like, for, for taking on some of the support, support responsibility for those communities. And hopefully end up with um, you know, happier users and um, a less stressed support team as well. So benefits for everybody. Thank you. Right, thanks Matt. So next up, we've got Ag again with the notebook service. Hello again, everyone. So in case you've just joined in, I'm Ag Stevens. I'm the head of partnerships at CEDA. And I'm gonna be talking about a, um, an exciting new service that, that we've launched within the last year. Um, I, I wanna particularly name check um, my colleague, Matt Pryor, who's um, done a, a lot of hard work to make this happen. And, and a number of colleagues in, in SCD um, the scientific computing department have helped bring this together. So um, some of you will know all about Jupyter Notebooks um, and what they are, um, but if you don't, this is the talk to give you an introduction to those things. And then I'm gonna talk specifically about the Jasmine Notebook service. So why should you use our service rather than others? And then I'm just gonna highlight some of the particularly useful features about the Jasmine service as well as one or two of the limitations of it. So coming back to how this fits in in the bigger picture, um, we have a little box here in our, in our interactive compute section of our compute services. So at the moment, many of you will log into the SI servers and do different types of interactive work. The notebook service is an alternative, um, inter alternative platform or environment for you to be able to work with and do very similar things. Um, and we'll see why, why it's similar and why it's also different. So what is a Jupyter Notebook? So on the left here, slightly too small for you to be able to see, is a little screenshot of a Jup Jupyter Notebook. You've got all these cells and within cells, you've got um, some kind of what looks like Python code. And you've also got some sort of um, Bit, bits of just comment in between, but they're, they're rendered nicely. Okay, so Jupyter Notebook is an interactive programming environment. 
And the beauty of it is that it runs in a web browser. So it could be running in Chrome, Safari, Firefox, etc. A, a, a notebook allows you to define, edit and run code interactively. So in our case, this is Python code. It allows you to embed, so to create, first create and then embed visualizations and comments within your code to demonstrate what it does. So it's a bit like, in one way, it's a bit like something like a lab book that you're, um, you're able to write down what you're doing, why you're doing it and show and actually then execute the code itself. Um, so yeah, you can document things as you go. And one of the real strengths about notebooks is that you can package them up, put them on um, open repositories such as GitHub and share them with a wider community. And there's some really good in integrations with GitHub that allow you to actually run notebooks on free cloud services directly out of a GitHub repository. So one really good way to have a look at what a notebook is, is to actually see one in action. And so here's one I've prepared earlier and hopefully it will load and we can just have a look at it. So I've got a few tabs here showing different Jupyter, Jupyter Notebook sessions and these are running at notebooks.jasmine.ac.uk which is our Jasmine Notebook service. So as you can see there are each of these individual cells I'm typing into them and it's as if I'm running Python interactively. So I can just write simple commands like print, I can do base, basic arithmetic, but this is great. I can even import um, externally defined modules and libraries. So I've imported math here and I've accessed math.py. And actually we can get even more complex. So we can define variables. So I'm defining um, zero, the, the um, value in Celsius of, sorry, in, in Kelvin of zero degrees Celsius. And now I'm defining my own function where I'm going to use that um, particular variable. So I define a function called convert temp and it takes one input and it does a very simple bit of mathematics. Having defined that, I can call it. So I sent the value zero into it and I can do that very simply. So we've got this really nice interactive environment. So we can save these things, we can use them, we can share them. But here's another really nice aspect of Jupyter Notebooks. You can create plots and it's again as though you're running Python interactively. This is actually sending everything off to a server that's doing all the work, but it's feeding back in real time. So we can create a very simple plot here. So, that, so that's, you know, it's, it's a nice bit of functionality. It's not very pretty. Let's see if we can do something slightly more interesting. So we can also, on the Jasmine service, we can read files that are actually held in the Cedar archive or that are held on group workspaces. And also we've got access to a wider range of um, software. So X-Array here is imported from a Jaspi environment that I was talking about earlier on. And we can say, we want to open this particular CMIP6 file. I'll just pause for a moment and just take us back there. So this, this CMIP6 file, which is in the CEDAR archive, a NetCDF file. So we want to open this, we're looking at surface temperature. And so we use X-Ray to open that using X-Ray's open data set. And we can display what's in there. So we can see information about the, the data itself, the coordinates, all the global attributes in the NetCDF file. And actually we can go one step further. So we're interested in selecting a 2D layer from this and then actually plotting it and being able to view the plot interactively within our notebook. So first of all, we do some selection in time on this particular data set. Um, so I, I actually, I've already understood what the time dimension was in here. So I know that there is a, a, um, a valid time value in the year 999, 15th of, of December, and I've squeezed out that layer. So the layer is just a two dimensional that long um, array and then here we can just call layer.plot so this is an um, x-ray talking to matplotlib and we get a nice little graphical plot here okay so that's a very quick introduction to what a notebook is 
So what's special about the Jasmine Jupyter Notebook service? So one of, the, one of the things is that it's been released very recently. You've been talking to us for years about could we do this? And finally, we've done this in a way that is secure and scalable. And, and we're very pleased with the, the results so far. So this is built using Docker containers um, and they deploy a notebook server per user. So each user has their own um, fenced off space that they have access to, um, which is completely separate from any other users. And this is available to all Jasmine users. So anyone can sign up for it if you have a Jasmine login account. And it's an alternative programming environment um, compared to logging in via SSH. You can access it from any browser. Um, and we've got Jaspi installed, so data analysis libraries already installed, and it connects to the Jasmine file system. So all of those are really reasons why you, sh you might consider using the Jasmine service rather than any other service. So when you log in, you're automatic in your home directory, which is shared with your um, Jasmine SSH. Um, it, that, when you log in via SSH, you've got access to the same home directory. So you can read directly from the slash VADC and slash NEODC archives. So these large parts of the CEDAR archive, if you have access to them in an SSH session, you have the same access through a notebook. You can read from group workspaces that you have access to. You can't write to those at this point in time, but you can read from them. And then we have the common software. And we also have advice on our help pages that explain how you can um, add new packages to an existing environment. So if you need to install a few extra Python packages, there are ways of doing that. So as I demonstrated in the example, we can read from slash BADC and here we're just show, showing that we can list the directory and see what's in there. In the second example, I'm saying I'm actually calling out to the shell with this exclamation mark and that shows me all the groups that my user has access to. Because I'm a CEDAR member of staff, I have access to way too many groups here. Um, but that shows me I can access the CMIP6 prep um, group workspace and then I can list that and find out what's there. So it's really useful that you can access data directly on the file system on Jasmine. About a minute, Ag, sorry. I'm Thank you. Um, so we've got this batteries included approach. So this is about having Jaspi environments already available to you. Um, and you can also build your own virtual environments within Jaspi um, to extend them if you need to. One of the really nice things about notebooks is that you can share code. So as I said, it integrates really nicely with GitHub and you can potentially share and even run those notebooks um, via a GitHub extension on cloud services. Um, it's important to know that if notebooks are, um, they, they will only run correctly in other places if they've been configured with the required software and also if they have access to the data. Um, just to mention that there are potentials for this to be used by the community in different ways. So potentially it could be used for webinars and, webinars and training activities. Um, and we're finding already they're really useful as ways of sharing information about analyzing and working on CEDA data. Um, and just to mention very briefly that there are some limitations. Um, so at the moment, there's only one Jaspi environment installed as I said, you cannot write to group workspaces. Um, and by design, this service does not integrate with the Lotus Batch cluster. So it's more about interactive, um, interactive compute rather than batch compute. And there's some useful links there you can follow up with um, if you get copies of the slides. Thank you very much. And I will hand you back to the next speaker and I believe that's Matt talking about cluster as a service. Thank you. Thanks, Ag. It is indeed Matt up next. Oh, the background's all gone all squiffy. Don't worry. In fact, it's lost all my Zoom's lost all my background. Never mind, we can just see your real life background, doesn't matter. It's not very professional, but it is the room which I'm in. So. <laughs> um, let me share my screen. 
So. Can you see that? Is that the right screen? Yeah, you're fine. Cool. So I'm going to talk a bit about the cluster as a service capability that we've developed for the Jasmine cloud. So uh, the things the things I'm going to talk about are, you know, what is cluster as a service? What kind of benefits might you see? How do you access the data that's on Jasmine from that service? A uh, quick demonstration. And then if I get time, uh, a little bit about how it works for the for the nerds. Um, this is where we sit. Uh, so this the cluster as a service currently operates in the external cloud. Um, so in this cloud part of the context diagram. And so cluster as a service is providing building blocks for you to assemble your own custom platform in the Jasmine cloud. So what it does is allows users of the Jasmine external cloud to easily manage these clusters of machines that are stamped out from these um, templates. And the clusters, they come pre-installed with particular software. So we'll see some examples of that on the next slide. Um, the Jasmine Cloud Portal provides a user-friendly interface to deploy and manage these. Um, we'll see that in the demonstration. Um, these clusters, some of well, some of these clusters, the ones which uh, have multiple sort of worker nodes, can be grown and shrunk, obviously within the envelope of your tenancy quota. Um, these clusters generally take 20 minutes or less to deploy and configure. So you can sort of manage, you can envisage a world where you would use these as disposable clusters, where you spin a cluster up, run your workload, and then tear it back down again. Um, but that's obviously not great if you want to use the cluster to run a service. So we also have thought about that, and there's a, an option in there to apply security patches to long lived clusters easily. Um, it is still your responsibility, as it is with the rest of the cloud, to actually remember to apply security patches. So, uh, the benefits of, of using Cluster as a service. So these are the, down the right hand side, there's a bunch of logos for all the types of cluster that we support. So we have an identity cluster, Kubernetes, um, Gluster, which is a distributed file system. We, you can get your own Slurm and we also support Pangeo, which is a framework that, which is a, a bunch of library. It's a project that provides like an opinionated Jupyter notebook service. So you can spin up your own Jupyter notebook service. So what you get is dedicated clusters for your projects. So no competing for job slots on Lotus with other, with everyone else. Um, this clustering software, it's difficult to configure and CAS can do it for you. Um, you still get root access as the cluster manager, so you can apply your own customizations on top of the CAS managed clusters. Um, try not to break the actual CAS functionality when you do that. Um, your users don't have to be Jasmine users, which is an interesting one. So only the managers of the tenancy have to be only the people who are deploying and managing the clusters have to be Jasmine users that can access the cloud portal. Um, CAS provides an identity manager that you deploy inside your tenancy and that manages the identities inside the clusters and they're integrated across all the clusters in a tenancy. Um, so, and then, as I said before, these are the sorts of clusters it supports. So you can use Kubernetes to build services for end users. You can run a Jupyter notebook platform for your project using Pangeo. Um, you can run your own Slurm cluster for your project. Um, accessing data is slightly trickier because this is on the external cloud. So um, that means they're outside of the Jasmine firewall and so they can't mount the Cedar archive and group workspace file systems because of the because of this difference between the users. Um, however, you can still access data via the usual mechanisms for external access. So the HTTP access we provide and especially the object store um, and the clusters, they still benefit from being co-located in the same data center as that data um, and we strongly recommend that CAS users use the object store and um, so I'm going to see if this video will play hopefully come on 
So this is just showing the Cloud Portal interface. So there's the clusters tab. I go to new cluster, select a cluster type, um, click on it, fill in some details for the cluster, pick an IP for it, fill in some passwords, um, pick an admin IP range. So this is the this is a, a security feature to restrict the IP addresses that can access the admin interface of the identity manager. So um, so that you can only access it from your institutional place. And then this is an accelerated version of the cluster deployment. So it goes through all these tasks and 20 minutes later you have a an identity manager. The identity manager is actually the thing that takes the longest to deploy out of everything. Um, for some reason it takes a long time to configure free IPA. And there's the machines that it's created in your tenancy. Um, so I'm just going to skip this video forward a little bit and you can see that it eventually becomes ready. I'm going to also deploy a Pangeo cluster next to this. So um, I'm going to skip over this because it's not that interesting. Um, you, th this is an interesting bit. You can, so you can, for your notebook cluster, you can customize the number of CPUs, the amount of RAM and the storage that your notebook servers will get. Um, and then this goes off and it does the same thing, creates and configures. So while we're look, while that's creating, we're going to look at what the identity manager looks like. So this is what free IPA looks like. Uh, you log in with the admin password that you set at the time. You can manage your users in here. Um, the, and you can also manage groups in here. So you can create new users. You can put them in groups so that they can access particular clusters. And so I'm going to skip forwards a bit in here and talk about a bit more about Pangeo, which is the one of the interesting bits. So this um, Pangeo, Pangeo, as I said, provides a notebook interface. So we can go to the notebook interface for the cluster that we just deployed. We can log in as, um, I think I actually demonstrate adding this user, that this user can't get in to start with, and then we add them to a group in free IPA and then they can get in. So this group is automatically created by the cluster as a service system. You can add your user to it and then and only then can they get into that specific notebook service. So you you so this is providing a way for you to manage your community's users. And, and then once you're in you get access to a notebook interface. So let's skip this forward a bit. Um, and here's the notebook interface. This actually has full support for things like Dask. So this is this is showing a Dask cluster um, doing some random computations. Um, and this is the Dask task graph. So we can see that evolve if I, if I do this. So this is Dask running. You can see that it's spinning out new workers and things in the Kubernetes cluster. So I think that's probably enough of the demo. Um, so you've so, got about two minutes, Matt, all right. Um, I just wanted to, okay, cool. I just wanted to talk about uh, a use case. So the British Antarctic Survey are using Pangeo on cluster as a service. They're using um, machine learning to find structures, large scale structures in climate model ozone data. Uh, these methods, they're emerging as tools for robustly identifying coherent structures and Pangeo provides tools to, for researchers to use these methods in a fast and intuitive way. Um, part, partly this is down to the sharing aspects of notebooks that Ag was talking about before. Um, and the cluster as a service facilitated this work by providing the Pangeo platform, making it easy to use. And they've identified some large scale structural ozone differences. So the very last thing I wanted to say was just a little bit about how it works. So there's a few technologies involved here. Um, our cloud is built on OpenStack and the cluster as a service uses the heat orchestration service. Um, that's driven by a tool called Ansible, which is used to automate the deployment and configuration of the clusters. And the Jasmine Cloud Portal works with a tool called AWX or Ansible Tower, which manages the execution of the Ansible jobs. So that's just, that's a slide for the nerds really. So. <laughs> Um, 
yeah, so that that's all I wanted to say about about the festival as a service. Ah, thanks, Matt. Um, so so ne uh, next up is Fatima, I think. It is indeed Fatima. Are you there, Fatima? Oh, I haven't made you. Yes. Hello everyone, um, for those who just joined, I'm Fatima Chami and I'm uh, the Jazz Minister Support uh, um, member in CEDA. Um, so I'll be talking today about transition to SLURM, which was part of the migration uh, um, plan of um, Jasmine this year. So I'll get, I'll give a quick introduction about the new scheduler Slurm and uh, why we need it, um, some essential command on Slurm and also what has been uh, implemented uh, in parallel to the transition to the new scheduler. So Lotus is a, a complex um, multi-node cluster of different um, model and is composed of compute node and GPU nodes and it needs a, a workload manager um, to manage the resources. The first workload manager was LSF uh, which was running um, out of support so the replacement was uh, necessary and the popular alternative to the IBM LSF uh, a workload manager was a uh, slurm. So slurm is uh, stands for a simple Linux utility for resource management. Was developed at Liverpool, uh, Livermore, and it's um, um, highly scalable for clusters uh, for, for the cluster. So it can be used for small to large cluster size, and also scalable for job scheduling. Um, um, so it ha it has. Um, I would say optimize, it's been optimized for the, to fit or meet the throughput, throughput in Jasmine. And also believed to be used by many top 500 supercomputers. Um, as I said, we need to be replaced because we were, um, we, the um, support for IBM platform um, uh, ended, so we needed a replacement. And Slurm is an open, soft, uh, an open source software it offers the capability uh, of LSF, which is queuing system to maximize the utilization of the cluster, highly scalable. And also it, it was chosen because it provides, um, it's consist, it's been used um, in Archer Met Office. It's give a, a bit of easy transition for a user who works in different clusters so they can find themselves very familiar using the same scheduler on Jasmine. So what we did in during this transition, we have kept the same number of submission nodes. Um, it's just that those nodes has been upgraded to the uh, new operating system. Um, and we have, in addition to this, we have provided uh, one node which is different. It has a different uh, processor model, which is AMD, which is node side three, which I put a note here. We also uh, kept the same number of queues and we kept the same configuration for those queues in terms of time limits and uh, CPU resources to make the transition as easy as possible. It's just the management is done by a different piece of software, which is slow. So this is just now we the, the when we started um, the, the migration or to the new system was done uh, um, gradually and now we have the whole of Lotus managed by Slurm um, and this is just a kind of nice diagram showing um, showing the queues and this workflow. So you have the Slurm scheduler to schedule the job to a specific queue. Jobs will wait in the queue according to the priority, which is priority of the queue and the priority of the uh, job itself. 
and then the slurm, get, um, slurm will cycle through the, uh, the uh, compute node to see which compute is available and which compute has the required uh, resources and then the job gets allocated the resources and starts running in Lotus. And when the job is on in Lotus, it, it can access all this um, uh, working area like home, group workspace, cedar, and it has access to the work scratch area uh, if needed. So what are the important uh, features just to, to, to know is that um, Slurm has a, a mapping of what we call partition and account. Well, partition is similarly a queue and account is, is a grouping of users to, to give them access to a partition. So the default account for all users in Jasmine is Jasmine. And those, the account Jasmine has access to all of the six uh, uh, um, standard queues. So you might uh, initially, there has been, if you're not, if a user is not a part of this, account, of this Jasmine account, um, they might not be able, they will not be able to access the queues. And sometimes this happened because the, um, we add users, it's done manually. So sometimes users might try to submit and they might get a message account and partition not matching. It just ha means that they are not in that Jasmine account and they will just contact us and we'll add them. Another feature that has been enabled during this transition is what we call the control group interface which um, uh, limits the resources usage per job. So if a job got, has an allocation of, of, of resources, for example, the CPU, and at runtime, it starts to exceed the allocation, it will be uh, completely constrained to that allocation. It won't go and consume other, C other CPUs in the same host. But it will start running slow. I think I've already mentioned this yesterday. And um, if it runs slow, it might, might just be killed at the end. Uh, another feature is the queuing of jobs in Slurm. So if the node starting um, having um, being faulty or having low memory, um, there is there's a queuing, um, the job get queued, but the user can release the job queue to resubmit them again if they want to. Um, also, um, I wouldn't say node state and well job state. There has been another state that was added in for the job state, which is when the job is about to complete. Um, Slurm has this uh, feat of CG, meaning the job is about to complete. Um, um, comparing to LSF, is it a completed or is it running? And also gives access to see the nodes, node state, what is down in draining, draining or in idle. Um, so it's quite good information in terms of uh, seeing how what the overall uh, status of the cluster. So this is just a quick essential Sloan commands uh, that are easy to help the conversion to do to, from LSF to Sloan. So um, all features like uh, submitting interactive session are available on Sloan and can be easily converted. So the of workflow can be easily converted to this. And the majority of the, the, um, uh, the command can be grouped in terms of submission, controlling your job and also getting information about his historical um, job that has been run in the past. You've got two minutes, Fatima, okay. okay. So this is just a quick, uh, what, you, what Sloan gives like in terms of node states, you can be able to um, see which hosts are allocated to those queues and their state. I'm just gonna go quickly to, through this, also checking the state of the node through uh, using S control command and uh, controlling uh, job monitoring in Sloan. Um, I'll just skip through these slides. Um, job array for, and job dependency are all available on Sloan. And I'll come to this slide, which is differences. Of course, uh, Sloan is, an, is a popular uh, alternative uh, to LSF, but they are still different. So they're sharing the common feature, which is submission, mechanism of uh, submitting and controlling. But there are other features in, in LSF that are not available in Slurm. For example, um, uh, submitting jobs uh, on the fly, as, assigning project name, 
is not a, uh, well it is available in Sloan but it's not done by the user on the fly when they submit the jobs so this is done on the admin level another feature which is the LSF job grouping which gives you a hierarchical organization of jobs this is not available in Sloan and so for some of this feature my if, if possible to mimic them, why not? Might need some scripting. And that is that is at the cost of time, which is limited. So um, users who are really keen on doing maybe some scripting, and if it's where they can come to us and then maybe we can consider using, um, make that centrally available for others. New feature is the um, new MPI library. So oh, the, um, we, in the past we used platform uh, MPI, uh, of course, because it's running out of support, now the replacement is OpenMPI, and the reason it was chosen because it's a support network, network link failure. It's an open source and um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's MPI 3 compliance, three versions available, like version 3.1.1, version 4, and it's fully supports so, um, support, uh, MPI IO. But again, I mentioned the MPI should be on the, only on the parallel file system, uh, scratch area work, scratch PW. Um, MPI implic implications, so any MPI application has to be built against the new open MPI. So this is a requirement and those, and this requirement is for C, for Tranco, any compiled languages, any MPI program using singularity has to be built against this library, um, MPI, uh, binding uh, for Python, Pilot CDF. And the way to, uh, to invoke the MPI implementation is through module environments, um, EEB, Open MPI. We, we, as I said, we have th three different module environments for different versions of MPI and different compilers. And MPI run is the command to use to launch the parallel MPI job. So this is just an example of invoking an interactive session and compiling some code, loading the, mo the module uh, Intel and the OpenMPI module environment, compiling a co code and learning and getting some results. Uh, the last, uh, I think this is my last slide, or one just before the last, is in the, we introduced a new, um, a new set of uh, uh, hosts, which are, have a different uh, processor model to the previous one, which is an AMD. In total, 43 AMD nodes have been added. Each node has 48 cores with a large memory of one terabyte. And these uh, hosts are grouped in, uh, under the host group EPC 21024G. Um, some implication on using AMD is it's not all the time an Intel compiled code can run on an AMD, so they might trigger some error, especially if some compilation um, uh, or compilation flag like optimization and other architecture dependent. So it is better to compile the code and it running on the same CPU model um, uh, machine. And that is done by selecting um, uh, the constraint flag. Uh, for this. So this is applicable whether it's to AMD or Intel. Compile language should be running on the same uh, processor model on which they were, in which the binary was generated. And uh, these are lists list of references and um, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm Neil Massey. I'm a software engineer at um, CEDA and I'm going to talk about object storage. Um, today. Yeah, thank you. So there's a quick overview. Um, so what is an object store? And um, most importantly for users, what does this mean for my workflow? And what tools are available to help with this? And then how does this tie in with other services? So for context, this is the slide we've all been showing and this uh, object store is obviously a storage service. So um, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> so uh, what is a object store or object storage? Um, so it's a computer storage architecture in which objects are they're stored in a flat structure. There's, there's no, um, there's a very flat um, hierarchy to it. So uh, the objects, they're identified by a key, which is um, usually a URL. Um, objects could, are organized into buckets. Um, but that's the only kind of hierarchy and organization there is to it. There's, um, there's like an object store domain. So we, we have one called cedardev.o and that forms part of the URL. And then below that, there's a bucket. 
and then below that all your objects are stored in a as a, a flat uh, structure so there, there's no there's no directory hierarchy oh yeah so um so the object store uh, is accessed over http um with an api to go with that and um, most object stores use amazon's s3 http api um, so data is um, is uploaded and downloaded using the http put and get operations um, to get good performance you can split your data across different objects i'll talk about that a bit later on um, and then you can have two different levels of metadata so the system level metadata which is things like your um, access control and your um, and uh, the URL and um, yeah. And then there's also extendable metadata. So you can actually embed data about the, the um, object within the object itself. Um, and so that allows searching for data without opening the file. You can just query the, um, what's called the metadata server on an object store. And you can um, enable custom searches for user data. And access is controlled, is controlled by access keys and secret keys and also access control lists. And this gets over some of the limits you have on um, a POSIX file system with uh, access control, which gets quite complicated quite quickly. And you can run out of um, user, user uh, group IDs and so on. Um, okay, next slide, please, Papi. So to interact with an object store, um, you can, there's two ways you can either upload and download your objects to a file system which relies on you having a file system and is um, not the most efficient use of an object store or you can stream in and out of RAM and that's kind of like the preferred method of using an object store it uses all the um, performance uh, properties of an object store much more efficiently um, so next please I have to whiz through so what does this mean for your workflow? So unfortunately, legacy applications are used to writing to um, disk and they cannot read or write directly with an object store. So uh, the Jasmine object store, there's three different ways of using it currently. So you can use it prog programmatically and stream directly to and from an object store. So you can do that from within your analysis program. Uh, or you can use some more sophisticated libraries that can read and write directly to an object store. And those that we support or will be supporting on Jasmine are ZAR, X-Array, um, S3, NetCDF, Python, and um, Cloud Optimized GeoTIFF. Um, but and in the inter interim and for housekeeping, you can use the object store dynamically. So if you follow an analysis cycle similar to using data from tape where you retrieve it, analyze it, and then store it. And you can do this using simple tools like um, the mini up client or S3 command from Amazon, but um, this doesn't really use object stores to their advantage. And so one and two are much more preferred. Uh, next, please. So this is a quick programmatic example. Um, this is, you can, it's probably better off looking at this later when the slides are available, but I'm just showing that you, this is basically just streaming a file to uh, a very short string. In fact, a uh, text file in effect, to the object store and then pulling it back and um, printing it out. So um, next slide, please, Poppy. This is a bit more, a more um, uh, involved example where um, it's, got, it's using a NumPy array and then using a bytes IO object, which is um, essentially just like a file that's held in memory. So you can stream into that and uh, you can write into that, sorry. And then that bytes IO object is streamed straight up to the object store. So both of those examples, they don't, they don't use any disk to interact with the object store at all. They're just um, using the functions built into um, a, a library called Boto3, which is a Python library provided by Amazon to interact with object stores and some of their other AWS services, but we only use the object store part of it. Um, okay, next please, Poppy. So as I said, there's more sophisticated tools, um, libraries to enable you to work a bit more effectively. 
and um, these communicate directly with the object store so they, they don't need a cache or a working area. Um, the speed is comparable to um, as if you were writing across a network to a disk um, and then uh, with a large data sets it's still important to checkpoint your analysis I mean by that so if you're doing a large analysis it's a good idea to checkpoint it as Ag talked about yesterday but you could do you can do this to object storage you don't need to rely on a local disk to do your checkpointing either and the tools they may allow the subdivision of data into smaller objects which are sometimes called chunks and that's to improve performance and so currently at, op at CEDA there are two options for this there's X-Array and ZAR um, which is part of a Pangeo software stack or there's some software we developed ourselves called S3 NetCDF Python. So next slide please Puffy. So X-Array and ZAR, this is like a, a full analysis package um, similar to things like Iris and CF Python and it's for climate but also other data like time series data and so on. So you can read multiple different file formats including NetCDF um, it can read and write directly to object storage via um, an interface to ZAR that it has. So this can save arrays as ZAR stores and that uh, when you write to a ZAR store, it splits the array into multiple parts and chunks, as I mentioned before. Um, X-Ray and ZAR has plotting built in via matplotlib and cartpy. It can support parallel computing with Dask, so that's where you run an analysis on an array and it splits the array up into multiple parts and distributes it. And there's a piece of middleware called Dask, which uh, marshals all that for you. Um, so that, this is available on, supported on Jas Jasmine as part of Jaspi. And there's the uh, web address for it. Uh, next slide, please, Poppy. So um, S3 NetCDF Python, we developed that here at CEDA. Um, with help with funding from a... Sorry, no, you've got about two minutes. Yeah, that, that should be okay, thanks. Uh, with EU Horizon 2020 funding, and you can install this in user space uh, via a, a Python 3 virtual environment. You don't need to be sudo or root or anything to, to install it. Um, and so this is a direct replacement in terms of the interface for NetCDF or Python. So it's uh, completely com API compatible and you only have to change one line of code and that's your import statement. And this splits large NetCDF files into smaller uh, net, NetCDF files. So everything in S3 NetCDF, the smaller chunks are themselves self-describing NetCDF files. Um, and so this just makes it very easy to, for housekeeping and to view your smaller chunks. Um, so, uh, by having the smaller chunks, you can have a faster access. You don't have to read the entire or stream the entire file. You just um, stream the part that your slice is interested in. Um, and you can define this chunk size yourself, or there's an algorithm that um, does an optimization based on the array size um, to come up with the size for you. So it reads and writes directly to object storage. It handles very large arrays, so many gigabytes or even terabytes in size and it has sophisticated memory management so that even if you only have a small amount of memory on your machine it will still allow you to handle these very large arrays and um, that's the github um, re repository location for it where you can download it. Uh, next slide please uh, Poppy. This is just a quick example I'll just flip through it it's basically just to show you that uh, yeah that's fine uh, it's, it, no, it's okay Poppy go, go on. Thank you. Um, and then the simple tools, there's the Minio client and that kind of uh, replicates functionality of POSIX. So there's LSCP, MVRM, et cetera. And then there's also S3 command from Amazon, which is has more features, but it's also more complicated. But as I said before, they don't fully exploit the properties of object store. Um, next slide, please. Uh, how it ties in with other services. So explore, object storage exposes the URL, the data at a URL rather than a file path. So you don't have to mount drives on different servers. And then it's, so the data is accessible from the external cloud and cluster as a service as Matt was talking about previously. And um, 
within the next few months we should be able to um, allow you to access the object store from compute facilities outside of Jasmine. And obviously this is subject to a firewall restriction, so we might have to whitelist your compute facility. Um, but also access restrictions is access control lists and keys and secret keys and so on. So I think the takeaway point is that object storage is much more suited to the cloud model of computing and um, we'll be using it a lot more in the future. Uh, thank you. And then next up we have Matt Jones who will be talking about metrics. Hey, thank you. Great, right, thanks now. I'll stop mine because I'm host, so I don't know if you'll be able to take over from me, but you should be okay now. Fab. Ooh, I think you're still muted. Ah. Yep. Oh, we're going to hear you now. There we go. <laughs> um, I, so I, I'm Matt Jones. Um, so we're talking about metrics. Um, just to note, this is a service which is still in development, so isn't yet available. So uh, in the context of uh, everything else, uh, the metric service is a planned uh, information service. So just to overview what I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to uh, discuss what we mean by metrics. Uh, how we're gathering them, how we are using them, um, how you will eventually be able to use them, and then go through some quick um, work in progress examples. So a metric is um, a, measure, a measurable quantity which can be used to build time series data. So we've got some examples here. This could be uh, the usage of uh, group workspaces, including volumes and tape. Um, it could be the uh, overall uh, storage of Jasmine, um, the user numbers for specific services, such as the number of users on group workspaces uh, or, or, or in cloud tenancies, um, other, uh, uh, other cloud usage stats uh, are available as well, such as the number of CPUs in the storage utilization. And then we're also planning to add in some load stats as well. Uh, for example, utilization and uh, potentially queuing times. So we're using a, a, a few different technologies to enable this. Uh, Influx and DB, which is a, a time series database. Um, Elasticsearch, which is um, uh, uh, quite, quite a large, uh, a large piece of technology, but it's, um, it in fact is uh, a distributed open source search and analytics engine for all types of data, which is can be optimized for uh, time series searches, and is also flexible so that the records don't have to have the same structure. So in effect, we're we're also using this like um, uh, a time series database for metrics. The next one here, um, metric B is part of the Elasticsearch stack and it's what's called a shipper or scraper. And what that means is that it um, reads the metrics from a specific style of endpoint and then can store them into Elasticsearch. And then uh, we're using Grafana for our visualization um, as a, a web application which is going to show the dashboards. So just a few of the sources uh, that we've got, uh, there's an, an influx DB instance uh, which contains some of the, the system metrics. Um, we're also getting some information from the Jasmine accounts portal the elastic tape and storage D status pages, which is our um, tape technology. And we're also getting some Lotus metrics from software called XDMod. So this is just a summary of the current architecture. The metric service is a Python Django web app. Um, 
it uh, uses Prometheus style endpoints, which is just a specific style of metric. Um, it gathers the information from the sources. You can see those examples there are on the left. And met metric beat uh, scrapes these endpoints and stores them into Elasticsearch. Then Grafana uh, ha displays the dashboards um, and it reads all this information for, uh, straight for live from Elasticsearch. Um, I'll show like uh, a couple of work in progress examples of two dashboard two dashboards in a minute. And the idea with these dashboards is that we'll have targeted ones aimed for different user groups. The examples here show as the group workspace managers and a general Jasmine user. The metric service is also used for some um, uh, internal information gathering. So it inputs some information into the uh, Google Workspace Scanner and is used for some internal reporting. So as I just touched on how we are using the metrics, um, we hope that the dashboards will allow Group Workspace and consortium managers to keep more up to date on the usage of their um, volumes and tape usage. Um, as I said, uh, it, it will also be used for some uh, internal reporting. So for example, board reports and quarterly reports and feed into other, other, group work, other um, services such as the Group Workspace Scanner. And it, uh, the time series nature of the metrics can help inform the decisions for the future of Jasmine. So the idea of how you will eventually be able to use the metrics, just two ideas of dashboards here, we, we've, uh, which I'll show. We've got a group workspace and dashboards with the volume tape usage and history and the number of members. Um, this will hopefully expand in future as well. And then uh, a general Jasmine dashboard with some uh, interesting information, also uh, status and usage of the, the uh, Jasmine uh, system and services. And then we plan to expand these as well. So as I said, um, group workspace and consortium manager dashboards and hopefully other user groups such as cloud users. So here's an, uh, a work in progress example of uh, like a Jasmine landing dashboard. See at the top, we've got um, uh, sub, sub dashboards such as the group workspace dashboard and storage metrics and then uh, just uh, uh, highlights of the metrics here so total number of Jasmine users, uh, number of group workspace volumes and then some storage metrics just to note some of these figures are uh, raw rather than usable volume at the moment. Here's an example of the group works of a group workspace dashboard. So uh, just uh, just highlighted there in the top right, you can change the time period for which the data was displayed. So here we've got the, the previous 90 days. Um, should just say that there wouldn't normally be the gaps in data here. This is just because it's um, got two yeah. minutes, Matt. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Um, on the left, uh, there's a drop down um, where you can select the uh, group workspace which is being viewed. And we'll also add, you can view a specific um, volume on a group workspace as well. Uh, this is what is shown here. So th th this is a more uh, advanced plot showing a bit more of an interesting group workspace. So uh, this specific group workspace at one time had four separate volumes. The green and the yellow are, show the overall usage for all those volumes. Uh, and you can see where the volumes are added and taken away. And then the blue and the orange show the usage for a specific group workspace. 
oh, so sorry, a specific volume in that group workspace. And then just a, a, another interesting plot here, which is the total number of Jasmine log, 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 logging grants from January 2019 till I think the end of August. Um, you can just see uh, an interesting jump and um, um, an reduction there as well, which we believe is when we added some um, workshop users. So it's quite interesting to see how much that grows over time. Okay, so that's all everything up. Um, thanks for your attention. And up next, we have the Q&A panel. Uh, thanks, Matt. Right, if you could stop your screen and then hopefully everyone will be able to see all of our lovely faces ready for the Q&A panel. Um, got lots of empty screens, so if you want to, um, that's it, turn your cameras on. Thank you, everyone. Fantastic. Um, okay, so we have got lots of questions um, and lots of the faces that you can see here are the speakers that you've um, seen and heard from over the past couple of days, but there will be two names that um, you may not be familiar with. So instead of going through everyone's names, I'm just going to ask Jonathan and Brian, can you just give a little intro as to who you are and why you're here? Really quick though, because we do have lots of questions. <laughs> so I'm Brian Lawrence, I'm the Principal Investigator for Jasmine. Thanks Brian. And uh, I'm Jonathan Churchill, I'm responsible for the physical infrastructure of uh, Jasmine and its, uh, its architecture. Fab. Thanks, Jonathan. Right, I'm going to jump straight in because we have got loads. So we've tried to try, tried to group the questions into kind of categories. So the first category that we're going to cover is more about the organisational role of Jasmine. Um, so the first question is uh, we have a NERC funded grant with partners, two organisations, but probably four people in different parts of the UK that would benefit from access to Jasmine. Can you say something about the shared workspaces and how to apply one? Um, how do you go about setting up an account, applying for use, and is there a cost involved? So Matt Pritchard, this one's probably best for you. Okay, thanks. Um, so there's, there's probably several parts to this really. Um, uh, in the first part, the, in practical terms, um, the place to go to um, make yourself an account is the Jasmine Accounts portal. So that's accounts.jasmine.ac.uk. Um, and uh, you can make yourself an account. You can get, up set, uh, you can get set up with your um, uh, SSH key and apply for the various roles that you need um, to access the resources on Jasmine. Why the question is, um, I think, um, you know, who, who's Jasmine for? Who, who's able to, to use Jasmine? And um, so I kind of prepared a, a little slide which might help with this. Um, so maybe if I can just share my screen and show you that to help in the discussion. Um, do you want to share? <clears throat> so this um, sort of sets out how things are organised really um, in the Jasmine user community. So we have a system of uh, what we call consortia. Um, some of them are listed down here, although I've just realised it's slightly out of date. Um, but the idea is there's a consortium manager who represents um, particular areas of um, uh, the science community. And each, each consortium has um, an, an overall allocation of some of the resource types that we need to allocate to projects um, as they come on board on Jasmine. So uh, the different types of uh, disk media, but also um, there's bits in progress actually, uh, allocations for um, the cloud uh, platform as well. So when a new project comes along, um, they would um, first of all talk to their um, relevant consortium manager um, who would uh, be able to advise, first of all, you know, whether their, um, the, the, the funding for their project, whether they're kind of, um, uh, that makes them eligible for, for, um, for using Jasmine. But essentially it's to the, you know, to the NERC environmental science community um, and friends. I think Brian can probably say a bit more about that after me. Um, so they, they would be able to advise and, and also um, sort of tension the different requests, priorities for 
uh, projects within that particular community. So then a particular um, project PI, um, who sometimes doubles up as, as, as the um, sort of group workspace manager, um, would then be uh, you know, provided with those resources on Jasmine um, to share among their users. So they'd then be responsible for um, you know, granting access to, to um, uh, the group workspace, for example, or the cloud tenancy. Um, we've got a sort of tenancy admin over here, which is equivalent to the group workspace manager uh, for, a, for a cloud tenancy. Um, so uh, yeah, so we've got a, a kind of a system of overall allocations to consortia, and then within that, um, allocations to individual projects. Um, uh, but for yeah, for the for the sort of practical details of actually how to get online, um, it's the accounts portal. There is a bit more information about um, you know how to request um, a group workspace, but also that covers generally you know how to how to request that your project. Um, is, is granted um, access to, to Jasmine, and that's here on this help article. Great, thanks Matt. Um, so I think that will lead quite nicely into the next couple of questions, which Brian, I think, probably for you. Um, so I'm going to paraphrase quite a few questions because yeah, we've had similar kind of ones. So um, will the prerequisite for using these services continue to be a NERC funding source? Um, and Another kind of similar question is, what do I do if my job is too small for Archer, but not a traditional data intensive workload? Um, someone has said, Jasmine is not being extended to be a NERC platform for mid-scale para parallelism. Um, so just asking about procurement and kind of the future. Okay, well, um, it's slightly different. So, so first, Jasmine is currently funded for NERC related science. Uh, isn't necessarily NERC funded, although uh, certainly NERC funded is, is free at point of use. NERC related science may require some contribution of funding depending on what's going on, but, but access should normally be granted. If the resource requirements are large, then the contribution of funding becomes larger. Even if um, it's NERC funded, if the resource requirements are large, that may have a funding implication. Clearly, Jasmine's finite in size. Uh, as, as to the other questions, which are, I think, more related to UKRI's e-infrastructure, which is a phrase you probably haven't heard too much of, um, UKRI is, tr that UKRI being the, the consortium of, of research councils, is trying to come up with the way of um, addressing the requirements that we all have for a range of computing in a way that doesn't duplicate activities across the research councils. That, for example, is why we have Archer as a shared activity between uh, NERC and EPSRC, and others actually can get access if they need to, but NERC and EPSRC mainly use Archer. Uh, the future for, for Jasmine-like activities will, will be in a wider UKRI activity. Um, and in that wider UKRI activity is provision for what you might call capacity computing, that is, the sorts of jobs that, as someone said, is too small for Archer and, and perhaps not traditional Jasmine. How we get from where we are today to that future is a moot point and one that's being discussed. And, and for obvious reasons, how quickly we get to that future may depend on all sorts of things um, in the next few months and, and years. Um, currently, NERC would recommend that you apply for access with either Archer or Jasmine and let us worry about it if you've got it in the wrong place. Um, but if you've got a NERC project and it has NERC computational requirements, um, then, then we would have a conversation about which of those is best with you directly. Great, thanks Brian. Um, so I think those are our kind of future looking questions. I might have a couple more that I've missed, but I'll move on to storage capabilities now. Um, so Neil and Phil, I think this one's for you. So the question is, what sort of workflows do you think would benefit from using the object store for their storage? So Neil, do you wanna maybe talk about tooling first and then hand over to Phil? Yeah, I think um, a workflow that involves, at this current point in time, a workflow that involves NetCDF is like going to be really advantageous for using the object store because the, the, the tools to read and write NetCDF, 
directly to object store already exist, as I showed in my talk earlier. Um, the kind of workflow that I showed where you retrieve some data from the object store, do an analysis and put it back. You could, you could do that, but it's not really using the object store to its best advantage. And you'd, you'd be just as well using elastic tape to do that kind of um, workflow. So Phil, do you want to say a bit more? Yeah, I, th I think um, a major challenge is, uh, historically has been the ability to share data across different parts of Jasmine, um, particularly um, into the cloud environment. And um, what um, some groups have been doing increasingly, we're, we're seeing more and more um, cases of this, is where um, they've got a requirement to share data through their, their cloud um, applications that they've built. Um, but they want to be able to produce the data in the first place or do some processing perhaps with Lotus. So um, there's a kind of workflow where the data is uh, processed with Lotus, it's transferred onto the object store, and the object store is, is like a way of then sharing the data in the cloud environment. So that, that's one example. Another one is that I'm starting to come across more and more cases where people are coming to us and they're saying, um, we want object store. As our first, that's that's our starting point. We want to use Object Store. So, perhaps they've had experience, um, for example, in the EO community using um, cloud optimized GeoTIFFs or something like that, or they're using Xarray and Czar. Um, there's Data Cube project, which I mentioned in my talk, which uh, Defra J and CC are doing. Um, so, I think it has um, a lot of flexibility there, and because it is using HTTP for access, it means that. Um, potentially you can access it from anywhere. At the moment, the way the access is set up is that um, you can access it between our cloud environment and the rest of Jasmine, but there are plans to make it accessible to the outside as well. So I think it's a really um, convenient um, means of, of making data more widely available because it's, it's using HTTP. Great, thanks Phil. Um, okay, so I think this next one is probably for you, Jonathan. So the question is, what's small in considering where to hold files? Thanks, Poppy. Yes, that's a, uh, that's a really good question. Um, uh, it's been coming up a lot more uh, frequently uh, now that we have, uh, have had multiple tiers of storage uh, since our Jasmine 4 round, which was now uh, two years ago. Um, so strictly speaking, what we call a small file is anything less than 64K. However, um, a 64K, uh, file and that includes anything down to a zero sized file will occupy at least 700 kilobytes um, if it's on our soft platform that's 700 kilobytes split over 11 different servers so you can imagine if you're trying to pull a one kilobyte file back and you're trying to access 700 kilobytes from 11 different servers over the network uh, there's a significant overhead and uh, that's why small files on the uh, what we call our soft platform uh, has been a uh, problem. Um, and that's why in Jasmine 4 we introduced uh, our flash tier. Um, so this is the thing that supports our um, SMF uh, volumes, our small file, um, also supports our home directories and the uh, scratch hyphen OPW uh, directory. Um, and that is specifically for uh, small files and metadata intensive uh, workloads. Um, but it's much more expensive than our soft platform, uh, so you get less of it. So at the minute, small uh, our SMF volumes uh, will, pre uh, will provision something up to 100 gigabytes of those, and uh, the, on the soft platform, it's anything from one to 200 terabytes. Um, so clearly, um, e even with uh, this um, 700 uh, kilobyte limit, um, it, you're not effectively uh, using soft storage uh, for even for 700 kilobytes and it, it doesn't really become optimal until you're up into the sort of the megabyte range something around about sort of uh, seven eight megabytes is what the, the soft vendor recommends so there is this gray area between 64k and uh, and uh, sorry the um, the small files uh, and small amounts of uh, storage on the flash platform which is great for compilation workloads for example um, and this kind of megabyte size range um, and uh, it, but it's a very good example of the work that we've been doing with the soft uh, vendor in the background um, to uh, to improve and add features. 
Um, many people probably won't know that the soft vendor that we use is uh, this company called Quobite. And uh, Quobite, uh, interestingly, um, one of their other customers is uh, one of the uh, large media streaming platforms, which I can't talk about who it is, um, but it was quite impressive when I found out who it was. But even that large media streaming platform, uh, Jasmine still has the largest capacity uh, Quobite storage on the planet today. So we're a very big customer and we've done a lot of work with them, uh, both um, for stability and adding new features. One of the new features they've just added is something that we've been asking and working with them to provide for the last year or so, a thing they call mixed file layout. And uh, this is something where we'll be introducing in the next year. We have it working on the platform now for experimental. And this is something where the small files are stored in a replicated manner, which is much more efficient. Um, and but as the file grows, uh, they grows onto uh, the hard disk tiers. And this is exactly the way that our parallel file system uh, works. It um, puts the small files less than 64K onto uh, SSDs and as the file grows, the rest of the file goes onto uh, hard disks. And uh, so we're expecting that to uh, significantly improve our ability to support people who've got um, a mix of small files and, uh, and large files in their group workspaces. Um, however, to support that requires literally petabytes of flash and SSD um, onto our size of platform. And that's quite a significant expense, um, but we'll be we're looking to procure that as part of this year's um, storage round. Um, but uh, as I say, it is it is a very good example of the sorts of things that the vendors have been doing for us because we are very important to them. And uh, clearly, uh, there have been a, uh, there were some other comments in the questions that we got about um, uh, the improved stability um, for uh, what we call the parallel write problem. And uh, that's, uh, that has largely gone away. Um, and we've been working on that very hard in the background uh, with, uh, with Quobite to, uh, to improve that capability. So, uh, sorry, yes, that's, a, yeah, that's a, a ramble over small versus large files and uh, what's going on in the background. Thanks, Jonathan. I think it's really useful to know the um, kind of context behind these things that are happening. Okay, um, the next set of questions are kind of surrounded around workflows. Um, so the first one is about software. So Ag, I think this one's for you. It says, we are particularly interested in R and using specific libraries within that. Um, some will compile C libraries on installation. On other platforms, it sometimes takes administrators to get involved. How would this be handled on Jasmine? That's a good question. Um, so we, we have limited experience within our team in terms of using R. Um, we've only played with it very peripherally. Um, but we have been in discussion with parts of the community that use it a lot um, because we would like to improve our support for R. But of course, and all these things come at a cost. And there's a limited number of things that we're able to support adequately. Um, so in the short term, we are looking at building an, an R specific Conda environment. Um, so using the JASPI approach but only looking to support R and a set of most commonly requested libraries within that. Um, and we've been talking to CEH about doing that. Um, and of course, users can install packages themselves within their own R workspaces. But I think yeah, oh, overall, we're looking for more community engagement um, if we're going to manage to provide significantly better our support but um we are we are meeting i think we're meeting next week to talk to ceh further about this but if anyone has a bit of time and effort um and interest then please get in touch with me and and we can talk about it further great thanks ag i think there's another um question which is probably for you as well um so they're talking about using a ticket particular technique of modeling um, but unfortunately the package providing the functionality cannot be paralyzed but for simulations we plan um, that we plan we would like to start separate instances on a large number of cores we used a similar strategy on another HPC via the batch script when queuing the job 
I wonder whether people do this on Jasmine and whether you might have template scripts. Um, so very quick answer. Do people do this on Jasmine? Yes, they do. So, so um, I mentioned yesterday in my talk on workflows that it, it's very common for people to bring a problem to Jasmine that they then need to scale up and run in parallel across a number of CPUs to potentially a number of servers. And that's, that's the sort of main use case for using Lotus. Um, so it makes good sense to separate out large workflows into a set of smaller tasks that, that can be submitted separately and run independently of each other. Um, and you can do this by writing job scripts, which are very simple bash scripts, which just um, provide some directives to the Slurm scheduler and, and then run whatever commands need to be run. But, but you, can, you can, and you can use those to wrap R, for example, Python, other languages. Um, you could also potentially use job arrays as a way of grouping a set of jobs into a single submission. Um, if, your, uh, if your workflow requires um, multi, a multi-step approach, so if it has dependencies to, between different stages, um, then you could also look at doing that through the Slurm scheduler or using tools like Rose and Silk um, that we have mentioned briefly um, the various parts of our um, talk, but they, they are also linked to our documentation, documentation and our training materials. Great, thanks Ag. Okay, so the next set of questions um, are all about compute and transfer tools, which as you can imagine, we've got lots of questions about that because that's what everyone's doing on Jasmine. Um, so I'm gonna try and pick out kind of the more general higher priority type questions. So um, Matt Pritchard, this one I think is probably for you. So it says, is there any plan to have a method of directing a user to a machine with low load directly instead of the user having to check the load prior to logging into a sign machine? Would be helpful when a particular machine is being hammered or is offline. Okay, so um, yeah, we do provide um, a view when you first uh, reach the login machines, the, the sort of message of the day presents a list um, of the available sign machines and you know how many users are currently on that machine, uh, the free memory and the CPU. So um, that's your that's your best uh, route to get an idea of how loaded those machines are. Um, it's fair to say that it's, it's not as easy as um, it sounds to then provide an automated um, way to route you directly to the to the to the least loaded sign machine um, we have tried a similar thing before with load balancing um, and it, it wasn't um, very successful so um, at the moment there's no solution for that uh, but the the information there should give you a good guide as to um, uh, the machines that are uh, the, the right ones to use it's probably not a good idea to kind of hard code your favorite um, sign machine as, as a kind of alias, um, it is best to refer to that list and sort of dynamically choose which one you want to go to when you, when you, log, when you go via a login machine. Um, I think someone's just added a follow on question, which I'll ask quickly. It's a, um, they say, can the message on the login machines about sign machines usage also be put on the sign machines when logged in? Is that the difficult bit <laughs> that you can't put it on the sign machines, you have to do it on the log? Login machines, Jack? Um, maybe Jonathan can answer that, I'm not quite sure. Okay. You're on mute, Jonathan. Uh, yeah, sorry, can you repeat this question? Um, so it was just a follow on question from the one that Matt was talking about, and they said, um, can the message on the login machines about sign machine usage also be put onto the sign machines when you're logged in? Um, it could be. Okay. <laughs> there we go then. <laughs> All right. Maybe so, that's something for us was, to look into. It was just the other point, uh, Matt, wasn't there about the tenancy sign machines as well? So that gives another capability yes, as well, I mean. doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we mentioned earlier about the problem of load on the, um, the general purpose shared sign machines. So the, the whole kind of tenancy sign machines um, project, if you like, gives, gives another solution to this. 
Um, yeah. Cool. All right. Thank you. Um, so we've had a variety of questions about Slurm functionality and kind of its differences to LSF. Um, so we don't have time to answer all the questions individually because they're all quite specific, but we will try and answer them where we can. But Fatima, did you want to just give a quick um, summary about the differences between Slurm and kind of what we're doing or not doing? Um, yeah, so um, we had questions about some features that are not uh, available or difficult to mimic and that needs um, some scripting. Um, but the majority of features that um, in terms of scheduling and um, assigning resources are there. Um, one feature that is, um, uh, I know it's important for some groups, which is the grouping of jobs. Um, if those users can come across with some solution, then we're happy to look at it and um, implement it, but we just don't have the time and the um, effort to uh, find a workaround. Um, there was some um, um, job dependencies in Slurm, uh, is the referencing to job is by ID number and not by job name. That was one of the features that was missing in Slurm. But there was a workaround and I had contacted the user. I, might, I make sure that workaround is available. But for the job grouping hierarchy is still not available and we don't have we don't have the work around it at the moment. Thank you. Um, okay, so Matt Pritchard, we've got a question about what skill set will be required for managing the tenancy sign machines. Um, and then kind of another follow on question, um, which is asking about the amount of resources that could be asked for and how many people you need to have your own tenancy machine? Yeah, yeah, no, that's a that's a good question. Um, so first of all, you know, so sort of what what constitutes a community, if you like? Um, looking at the number of projects we've now got on Jasmine, it's in the region of about two hundred and fifty um, sort of individual science projects. Obviously, we have finite resources, so um, I think it's fair to say that at the moment we've got. Um, too many projects or, or the other way around, you know, insufficient resources to give every project their own tenancy uh, to have a sign machine. Um, a, a, another kind of aggregation you could use would be the, the consortia. We talked about these sort of communities of um, uh, science uh, domains, if you like. We've got about 10 of those. Um, that's possibly too coarsely grained. Um, in a way, possibly the, the, the most important thing is that um, one of each of these groups has um, a person who's willing to be the manager to take on that kind of admin manager role. Um, and, and so what are the, the skills that they need? Well, they need to be able to, um, they need to know their community. So they need to be able to talk to their own set of users. Um, that ideally, they have an idea of what sort of workflows those users are um, interested in doing so they can, can sort of help them. Um, th this may um, work out best if it's um, you know, like a scientific IT um, support person within a particular institution or department um, that's possibly the kind of person we're, we're thinking of but um, I think it's fair to say we're in early days of this at the moment we need to decide how we're going to um, roll this out at a bigger scale um, so some of these things are still to be worked on um, but you know if, if you are interested in, in taking on that role uh, and, and you've got a sort of reasonably well-defined um, community that you're willing to do that for then um, please get in touch and we can look at that. Great, thanks Matt. Um, so I've got a similar question about cluster as a service. So I'm not sure Matt Pryor or Phil if you want to answer this one, but it's about again setting up and managing the clusters um, and whether the role is best served by the user's base IT department um, or who kind of should manage it and what's the skill set required to manage it. Um, so I can answer this. The, I would say that broadly for cloud for the use of the external cloud which is where you get where you get root access and you can do the most customizations that's also the place where you can do the most damage if you get stuff wrong so i would say in general we would encourage groups to treat that as an extension of their on-site it provision and that somebody with sysadmin experience should be involved in the administration of that um 
the same applies for the cluster as a service really except that a lot of the configuration the the only the thing it's doing on top is the configuration of these complex pieces of software and i wouldn't necessarily expect the person who's managing the cluster as a service clusters to be an expert in kubernetes or slurm or cluster but i would expect i would still expect them to have that base level of, of sysadmin skills yeah Great. And another kind of follow on question for cluster as a service. And um, they're saying, if I have a cluster as a service, can I give students fourth year undergraduates access? Yes. It's your cluster. It's in the external cloud. The users aren't Jasmine users. You, you can add whichever, whoever you, users you want. The nice. only thing, the only thing to bear in mind is that you, you as the tenancy admin are responsible for their behavior on the system. So if they behave badly, doing or use the jasmine systems to do things like to do bad things like launch the dnos attacks or anything like that it comes back on you as the tenancy admin okay thanks matt um okay so i'm not sure who this one's for probably ag it's about rose and silk to run jewels um so they say i use rose slash silk to run jewels um rose suites on jasmine silk and I think that still uses LSF. Is there any update on when slash how they, that will move to Slurm? Um, so yeah, I can give positive information about that. So we, um, as part of migrating all our servers from Red Hat um, Enterprise 6 to CentOS 7, we've had to move um, all our services to new servers. So um, earlier on in the year, we, set up a test silk server and then rolled out a production one. It's not fully documented. That's something we're in the process of doing, but the new server is simply called Cedar. Sorry, the new server is simply called silk.jasmine.ac.uk and it automatically integrates with Slurm. Um, so everything is set up to do that. And there are a number of users that have already migrated onto that and are using it in their, their production workflows. So please, please, where you've previously gone to jasmine-silk.cedar.ac.uk, now just go to silk.jasmine.ac.uk and it should all work for you. All right, thanks, Ad. Um, okay, this one's come in during today. I think it's quite an important one. So I say, <laughs> given that you say object store, is the way things are going. Um, for a lot of the community, this will be a big step change moving to a non-POSIX environment. Do you think CEDAR will run training sessions in the future to help users, uh, to help users make this transition? Who wants to tackle that one? Um, I, I can try and start it off. Um, I think it is gonna be really important to um, support the user community. Um, I think we are still learning about it ourselves and um, different patterns, optimum ways to store things and access the data. So um, it's something that's in process, I would say. So I don't think we could say today, you know, we can give a strict set of instructions, do it X, Y, and Z. I mean, we can, we can start to do that, but I think it's going to involve a process over time as it matures the solution. Yeah. If I can uh, do a quick chip in as well. Um, uh, one of the ways that we uh, procured object storage was an ability for people to um, interchange between uh, POSIX file and uh, object without having to copy the data around. So although uh, the things we're presenting to users at the minute and which um, Neil and Phil have talked about is, is uh, appears to be a standalone object file, uh, we do have um, object interfaces to our group workspace available um, in the back pocket as features, which we are hoping to roll out at some point. Um, and that will aid the transition so that uh, if you have a, group, a bunch of data and you've converted one part of your workload into the object model, you can try it out through the object interface. And uh, if there's some parts which are uh, still to be converted over, you can still carry on using the POSIX interface. Okay. I think probably to summary, we will give training at some point, I would say, because that's what we generally try and do. Um, but we're not at the stage to be able to do that yet. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it looks like um, something that we could probably roll into the, um, the form that some of, we've got some of the other uh, exercises in the Jasmine workshop, you know, providing some examples along the lines of AG's ABC unit kind of thing. Um, but ultimately, all we can do is provide that sort of template, if you like, for, for users to take away and, and adapt for their own individual um, workflows. Okay, great. Okay, I'm going to try and go through some of the ones which have come in a bit later today. So um, I'm going to guess who I think they're going to be for, but feel free to change them if not. Um, so what if I need to install a newer version of a given programming language, e.g. Octave? Ag? Um, so that really depends about the timescales. Um, if you need to install a, a language or a software package and you need to use it very quickly, then your best option is to install it into your home directory and use it yourself from there. Um, if you can wait a while, then you can put a request into our help desk and say, please, can you upgrade this version of this package or these packages to these versions? And please tell us which versions you need. Um, and then we can put that, add that to our list of target target versions that we will try and build into the next version of Jaspi or the Jasmine Sci environment. Um, and then we will do our best to include those um, as long as we don't hit any significant problems in trying to do so. At the moment, we don't have a uh, a, a regular time scale for when we make these updates. Um, I wish we did, but it's it relates to how much resource we've actually got to support our software environments. Um, but I ideally would be looking to to provide an update on a kind of three monthly time scale once we've got everything in place. Okay. Um, got about 10 minutes left. Um, I know that you can all see the questions. I'm not sure if there's any more that you desperately want to answer now. If there's any that have caught any of your eyes, shout now. Um, if not, we can answer the rest of them offline or I can just randomly pick. <laughs> so Poppy, there are, there are three about notebooks that I okay. think I can respond to very quickly. So okay, you go. I'll, I'll have a quick go at those. So somebody has asked, can you run a Jupyter notebook in a specific environment, one created with Conda, and how would you load that environment? Um, in, in general, um, a notebook comes with a pre-configured environment. So in order to fire up the notebook, you've already, you've already activated an environment and the notebook lives inside that environment. So you, so you can't really install another environment into a, a running notebook. Um, the, I suppose the, so that, that's, that's one overarching point. Um, Jupyter notebooks as a whole, um, it's really useful if they have some kind of, of set up environment script and Conda is a very good way of doing that. If you look at tools like Binder, which is a, a cloud service for defining and building Jupyter notebook environments, um, that actually builds, it builds notebooks on the fly in the cloud in, in Docker containers and it reads Conda environment files to, to build the um, dependencies. So that's one way you can do that if you're doing it with yourself. If you're on the Jasmine notebook service, I'm afraid you can't provide a different environment. It is possible to install some extra packages into a virtual environment. Um, um, and you can see our notebook service um, repository to find out more about that. Um, another one was, can users read and write to their home directories and scratch directories from the Jupyter notebooks? Um, so the home directory, yes, you have read and write access in the same way as you do in a normal SSH session. Um, in terms of the scratch directories, um, the answer is no, none of those scratch directories are made available to the Jasmine notebook service. Um, and that is intentional. Um, so typically you're only going to be writing relatively small amounts of data within a notebook. 
And the last question about notebooks was, is there an easy way to export a Jupyter notebook as a Python module? Um, I've, I've done some Googling and there is a tool called NB Convert. Um, so NB Convert can be installed with the, the pip command. Um, so you could install this into a virtual environment um, on Jasmine. And it's a, just a command line script. You give it the notebook as input and it will write a, a Python module as the output. Okay, like I have just spotted another notebook one, which okay. I've just copied in below. So hopefully you should be able to see that. Okay, is it possible to run a notebook in the background so you don't have to be logged into it for hours? I um, can take this, Ag. Yeah, go, Matt. So the answer to that is um, because of the... So we're intending the notebook service to be used mostly for interactive things. So if you've got long-running processing that's going to take hours to run, you should probably think about using Lotus for that. So... The answer to that is no, we, we, we don't leave, you can't close your browser and have your notebook keep running in the background because what we want is for, because that's not fair to other users who want to get on and use the notebooks for interactive things. Um, if you want to use, if you want to do stuff that's long running, use Lotus. Um, the second one, is it possible to use parallel computing with a notebook with Dask? The answer to that is not on the notebook, not on the Jasmine notebook service at the moment. Um, you can use Dask with notebooks in the cluster, in the JupyterHub that's offered in the cluster as a service in the cloud. Um, we are also looking at ways to support Dask better, but we don't have a, we don't have an integration with the notebooks yet. So. Okay, thank you. Um, so it's not really a question, it's just a comment from Patrick who's talking about um, the rose silk jewels stuff and it just says the main thing needed for jewels with rose silk is MPI libraries and net CDF libraries which have been tested. There should be further information to the jewels users list soon. Dave Case is managing this and I'll, I'll click answer live so you can see that as answered. Um, that's just more of a comment, I think. I'd be happy to take the one about the data transfer um, yeah. question, if you like, because I've got some wider comments about that as well. Yeah, uh, okay. Again, it would probably help if I um, put my slide up for this, because uh, there's a few bits and pieces to show. Um, so let me just do that. Do you want me to read out the question whilst you're doing that? Uh, yeah, it was the one about WinSCP, was it? Okay. So the question is, is there a way to configure WinSCP through VPN or through an SSH tunnel when working from home using the new transfer service? Yeah. So is that showing transfer services? Yeah. Okay. So um, I think the question is, is <coughs> um, related to uh, the issue of the sort of reverse DNS lookup and all that kind of stuff that we were talking about um, in relation to the login machines. And um, we mentioned that although we can provide um, the login machines uh, with a specific configuration to allow um, from um, you know, non-institutional networks, um, it's much harder to do with the transfer machines. And in fact, um, it's not necessarily the, the right thing to do. So um, the short answer is um, we prefer you not to do some um, fancy tunneling or whatever. Um, so perhaps it's best to just look at the, the available transfer services and talk through what they do. So essentially, um, we've got, oops, sorry, I'll go back a slide. Um, we've got the transfer um, virtual machines themselves, so the ones at the same level as the login machines here. So these are virtual machines, um, they're simple, you know, they're for simple and lightweight transfers. Um, they've got a bunch of tools on them which are, which are good for just moving, um, you know, a few files around, but nothing too heavy. In fact, those tools themselves, the SSH-based uh, transfer tools, are limited in their performance. They, they can't use all, even all the available bandwidth because um, of the uh, limitations of the protocol. Um, some of the tools are provided on those machines for sort of pulling things into Jasmine. So we've got WGET and LFTP, that kind of thing. Um, so uh, the pulling data into Jasmine, once you're on one of those machines, there's a few more things available. The HP Expert um, machines, which are the ones in the data transfer zone, these are essentially the same type of machine, um, uh, the same set of tools rather, 
um, but they're on a physical machine and um, so we're expecting higher performance from those. They're in a special zone of the network that's um, as close to, to the Janet, um, Super Janet network as we can get you on the Jasmine network. Um, so uh, ideally placed in that respect. Um, those are IP limited from outside. Um, but again, you've got the same sets of tools on those just to do the same kind of transfers, but um, a bit with a bit more grunt. Yeah? However, um, the, the third option is Globus. So this is also in the um, data transfer zone. And this is also the thing that we would recommend for people who don't have, um, who aren't able to connect using their institutional networks. It is a bit more of a learning curve to get set up with it. But we have, we have users in Oxford and we have users in New Zealand who use this. Um, and, and both are very, um, you know, they, they, they'd highly recommend it. Um, so this is a managed data transfer service. It's based on grid FTP under the hood. So it actually does the transfers more efficiently, uses all the available bandwidth. Um, so we've got an endpoint here at Jasmine. That's the Globus endpoint you can see here. You would need an endpoint either at your institution or you can set up your own um, Globus endpoint with a thing called Globus Connect Personal. Um, and then you can use a whole bunch of tools um, to do transfers between those two endpoints. So you can use, um, there's a, there's a web-based, um, browser-based uh, transfer tool, um, there's an API, there's a Python um, uh, layer, and there's some good examples of how to do and even automate transfers uh, using that system. And the nice thing about this is that we only need to permit uh, in our data transfer zone, the Globus IPs. Um, you can connect to anywhere from those Globus I to, to those Globus IPs, and then we've already um, put those on our allow list. Um, so it makes the whole thing a lot more manageable and scalable for doing particularly bigger, larger scale data transfers and makes life easier for everybody. Great, thanks Matt. Right, we're coming very close to the end. Um, so I'm just thinking, Brian, is there anything else you want to say as Jasmine PI? <laughs> have we have we covered everything? Well, I don't know. I'm, Sorry to I spring that on. We've I've, we've I've covered had... we've covered most of the questions, but is there anything else you want to add based on what we've been discussing? No, I don't think so. No. Fab. All right. just, well, perhaps I'd just say that that clearly we're trying to transition um, towards new technologies, but some of the technologies you're very familiar with will be around for decades to come. It's a bit like Fortran. Many of you will uh, will say that Fortran's useless um, and you'll be right, but there's still lots of people using Fortran. And I think POSIX will be in the same boat. So um, for many of you, POSIX will be, you'll retire with it, I'm sure. But for others of you, object stores will become really important. And that's both, both for both communities, that's fine. Great, thanks, Brian. Right, Matt, I think you've got some wrap up slides and then hopefully we'll be done on time for everyone to have lunch. Indeed. Thank you everyone for answering all of the questions. So um, yeah, just a few final um, slides to wrap up then really. Um, so uh, we can just sort of look back at what we've, um, we've talked about. So we had talks yesterday, um, uh, just giving an overview of, of what's happened during this year um, and some of the updates both on the software and the, the hardware and the cloud infrastructure. Um, we had the lightning talks. Uh, and then we talked through some uh, some common issues and solutions to those. Um, so that was yesterday. And then today we've had a series of talks about um, various components of Jasmine, particularly those that we've been, been really focusing on um, developing in the last, um, last year. So um, I hope you found all those useful. Um, all the slides and the video recording will be um, available soon, um, hopefully within the next couple of weeks. Uh, via the CEDAR website, the events section of the CEDAR website. Uh, and uh, yeah, I guess uh, we would be interested in to know how you think um, this event has worked. Um, so I think Poppy was keen to do a poll of everyone while they're still here about you know, if the COVID restrictions are still in place next summer, or maybe even if not, uh, would you like us to host a virtual conference? So, um, Poppy, if you'd like to get that going. I think you should be able to see it. Yeah, people have voted, so that's good. Looks like a pretty resounding. Oh, it's a resounding yes at the moment, which is good news. Although I guess the people, if they'd said no, they may not be with us right now if they don't like virtual events. So, we shall see. Okay.
Uh, give me another five seconds because not everyone's quite voted yet. But it's looking pretty widespread, so I shall end it now and share the results. 94% of people have said yes. <clears throat> okay. Um, excellent. Well, that's good to know. Um, so in terms of other feedback that would be really useful to, to have from people, um, I think uh, this uh, feedback um, questionnaire is going to be emailed out to you um, very shortly. And it would really, um, we'd really appreciate it if you could um, fill that in and let us know what you think of both this event and also the virtual format that we've um, obviously sort of trialled. Um, we'll be um, probably uh, doing this for our Jasmine workshop for the first time as well in um, uh, probably November time. We haven't quite set the date for that. Um, so I'd be really interested to, to know how you think it's gone from your point of view. Uh, it shouldn't take you very long and it yeah, should help us to improve our future events. Uh, so I'd be really uh, grateful if you could do that before you forget. Okay, um, so just um, remains for me to say uh, thanks very much to everyone um, for attending. Um, wherever you are, um, stay safe and I hope you continue to um, get the most out of Jasmine and uh, yeah, as ever, contact details are there. Um, thanks very much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. See you soon. Thank you, everyone.